The scripture lesson this morning comes from Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenants in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Our gospel lesson this day comes to us from the book of Luke. There in the ninth chapter, we begin at the 28th verse. Now about after eight days, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory, and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he had really said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. From the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent. In those days, told no one any of the things that they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met Jesus. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted out, Teacher, I beg of you to look at my son. He's my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seized the boy, and all at once he shrieked. It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed the boy to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. Jesus healed the boy. Jesus gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. But they did not understand the saying. Its meaning was concealed from them so that they could not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him anything about it. So end our lessons for this day. My practice over the last 32 years has been to come to church early. Early before the village wakes up, when it's still not yet dawn. Yet this Transfiguration Day was different than all the ones that have been before. Typically, in the early part of February, everything is so many different shades of gray. From soot and steel and ash, everything is frozen and cold and hard. But this morning, coming to worship, the lake was open and clear, and the sky was clear, and the sun began to rise, and everything turned hot pink and ice blue. Everything had this aura about it of being glorious and holy. I've missed being with you the last three weeks in this way. Being your pastor 
is a very precious responsibility. I don't think of preaching as reading a script or following a liturgy or performing what's been written for us. Instead, this is a conversation. This is an opportunity for us to talk with God, to have the Word of God inform our lives, to struggle with the circumstance that we live and how we're supposed to make sense of all this. It is, as Mario described with the children, our chance to talk to God. And sometimes we want to scream, sometimes we want to laugh, and most often we don't understand. And we sit in silence waiting for God to speak to us. I would confess that there have been times with this congregation that it's changed my color of my hair. <laughs> there have been times when I've had to be an instrument of God and it's been an uncomfortable place to be. But more often than not, it's been a wonderful time in a wonderful place to be the opportunity to name what has been unnamed. To be able in the midst of circumstance, sometimes hard circumstance, that this is a faith experience as well. And perhaps to name what otherwise had gone unnamed. What I find in the scriptures this day is by reading the scriptures, we hear something new each time. Not as a performance, not as a script, but instead reading the word, we hear in it words that jump off the page to us in this time that never did before. And what jumps off to me this morning is the word holy. Over and over again, when people encounter what is holy, it changes them. Moses went up on the mountain, and his face was changed. And when he came down, it was a distraction to people that his face was shining. There have been experiences in our lives that are so different than what anyone else can experience that we hide it. We cover it up. We try not to share with others what's really going on with us. Faith is uncomfortable. Holiness, faith, causes us to look into ourselves in ways we otherwise would not have done, never have before, and to struggle with, God, what are you trying to reveal to me in the midst of this? Moses went up the mountain and received from God a gift. Jesus went up the mountain with the disciples and there met Moses and Elijah and his countenance was changed. His face began to glow. And they realized this was not a performance. This was not something orchestrated. This was something no one had ever seen before. And they were amazed. The difference between magic and mystery is that magic is saying all the right incantations, waving your hands in the right way. And in that way, the priest, the magician, hides what's really going on with one hand while they reveal something with the other. Mystery is different. Mystery is not about the performance of the priest, not about saying the right words, not about doing the right things. Mystery is about allowing God to reveal what's really going on, looking deeper into the circumstance. Every time in the scriptures that I see the word holy, I've come to recognize this is like a where's Waldo in the midst of this complicated congestion of people. Suddenly there's that word holy and it causes you to point at what's beneath the surface and to look deeper in that spot for what's really going on. We live in a world today that is mired by law. We, are, we have laws for everything and loopholes to get around the law and we need to hire others to explain the law to us and to speak for us because we don't have rights within our own laws. That is not what the law given to Moses was about. Instead, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, for as long as generations could remember, had been slaves. They had been owned by the Pharaoh of Egypt. And the Pharaoh owned not only all of Egypt, but all the nations around them and owned every person within it. Every man and woman could be put to death or set free by the Pharaoh, could be bred, could be bought and sold. Whatever the Pharaoh's whim or will, 
whatever was in the Pharaoh's profit or pleasure. That was the person's desire. The Pharaoh even named himself to be God in their midst. And then Moses, following God, led them across the sea, parted the waters for them, and they walked across in safety and security to the wilderness. And then those waters came in and drowned the Egyptians, drowned the chariots and all their weapons and all their technology. And the Hebrew people said, well, we used to be the people who were enslaved by Pharaoh, so now we must be owned by Moses and by Moses' God. So whatever Moses' God tells us to do, we'll bow down and worship Moses. And Moses said, no. And Moses went up on the mountaintop and prayed to God for direction. And God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments, the law. But here it was not about what you need to do to be good, what you need to avoid from being bad, that you must come to worship every Sunday, that you must commit a tithe. None of that is what the Ten Commandments are about. Instead, God pledges here. While there was no requirement for it, while there was nothing we had done to earn it, God pledges, I love you. I love you. I will be your God for all generations. In all that is to come, I will love you. In response to which are other laws of what we need to do to make God happy, to help God to know that we love God. How do you communicate to a God? How do you show God your love? Growing up, I had three brothers. It's said in our family that the day didn't go by, that there was not a fight in the family, that one brother didn't throw a fist at another, that harsh words weren't said from one to another. So it was that my mother one day, when her birthday was coming up, said what I would really love for my birthday would be to have one day where you didn't fight. What a simple gift. Yet that's what we're commanded in the Ten Commandments. Do not kill each other. Do not covet what the other has. Do not lie about the other. Do not be jealous. Certainly God is a jealous God and God wants no other gods and God wants no idols and God doesn't want us to take the name of God in vain or try to abuse God and make God do what we want God to do. But what God truly wants is for us to love one another. And in that way, we demonstrate our love for God. We tend to make exchanges, one circumstance being like another. So when Moses goes up on that mountaintop, and receives the law, it is as reverent for us as Washington and Jefferson and Hancock at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It is like Lincoln at Gettysburg. These are moments out of history, moments in times and places where something important happened. And yet, on this occasion, when Moses went up the mountain, something even more glorious took place. Not only that he received the law, but he reflected the glory of God in their midst. He took on that glory and it became a part of him so that he reflected God's glow. It didn't last. Eventually, time would catch up and all the circumstances of the day would mire him down so that Moses became just like anyone else until he went in to speak with God again. And then he'd get that glow, that spark, that brilliance. It was a reflected brilliance of God. Convalescing the last few weeks, I've been reading and listening to old movies, hearing different reports on the news, and a statistic came across that I had never heard before. The news described that in every war, in every war that we have fought, there have been more who've died after they've come home than died by shrapnel or bullets or bombs. 
I couldn't believe that was possible. That the experience of war, of coming back into this reality of having survived, was so hard that there had been more who died from the post-traumatic stress than had died from the experience in war itself. And so I called a friend who was just a couple of years older than I, who had gone to Vietnam, and asked him about it. And you could hear the tears well up. And he said, in the platoon that I was a part of, there were 50 soldiers. 20 died on the battlefield. And in the years since we've come back, 29 have taken their life. I'm the only one left. Holiness. It's sometimes frightening, awe-inspiring, to realize that this life is precious. And sometimes we've seen things that are overwhelming to us. Sometimes there are experiences that we don't know how to cope with, and we don't know who to explain it to or how. That's the agony of post-traumatic stress, is we don't speak to anybody else about it. We keep it all inside. I don't know if the coloring of our hair, the tattoos, the piercings are all reaction to the circumstances in our lives. I have to believe a lot of it is a way of saying, pay attention. There's something different about me than's ever been before, something different than others around me. So pay attention and ask, what is this all about? I would confess to you this morning that standing out on the street corner, I waved as I always do, and nearly every car that went by actually waved back today. And all of those going across the Episcopal Church stopped and said, that's a sermon I'd really like to hear. We need to ask each other, what's going on in your life? It is more than simply about coloring your hair or adding a tattoo. There's something behind it for each of us. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. And this experience in Luke is different from anything that's happened before. Throughout Luke, we've had the announcement that Jesus would be born, his birth, his baptism, his calling the disciples, his being tempted, his healing, his teaching, his preaching, his wandering through Galilee and becoming this great rabbi that all came to listen to and were awed by and inspired by. And then here, at the center of the book of Luke, something miraculous happens. Jesus goes up on the mountaintop with them. And ever after, the book is changed. He goes up on the mountaintop, and there Peter and James and John see Jesus speaking with Moses and Elijah. They represent the law and the prophets. Jesus, in describing what's the greatest of the laws, describes that all the law and the prophets are hung on our relationship to each other and our relationship to God. Moses and Elijah are chosen because these are two characters in all the First Testament who glow. Moses, when he goes up on the mountain, speaks face to face with God, and for that he has a reflected glory, a holiness that shines for all the world to see. Elijah himself does not actually glow. But in his final days, after he's been a prophet for many years and called the nation to faith, he's about to be gathered up. Everyone knows that he's about to go to heaven. Even Elisha, who's beside him, keeps telling everyone, yes, I know, be quiet about it but stands there beside him until finally a flaming chariot comes out of the heavens, a glowing chariot and its horses comes down and gathers him up and carries him to heaven. And that glow, that fire, is about the passion that's there. It's about the holiness. It's pointing the way that what has happened in this one's life are words that we need to pay attention to. It's an experience different from what the nation has always gone about doing its rules and laws and wars, and instead trying to be holy, trying to be in relationship to God. But when Jesus speaks to Moses and Elijah, 
The disciples see something different than they do in Moses and Elijah. Moses reflected the glory of God. Elijah was surrounded by the glory of God when he's taken up. If Jesus is to glow, it would seem as though there has to be this fourth person, God there for Jesus to reflect. But instead, it glows from out of Jesus. Up until this point, throughout the Gospel of Luke, we've known the incarnation to be that Jesus was this innocent child who knew no sin. Jesus was this rabbi who called people to understand the law anew, who explained the teachings in ways they'd never understood before. But now, they could see God in their midst. Now they could understand God's presence with them. And it changed all of life for them. This was something new, something different. Dante coming into Mel and Mario's life has been something new, something brilliant that has changed their life forever. So also when Jesus began to glow for the disciples, it was something new that they couldn't put back in the box. They couldn't go on with life believing he was just a rabbi anymore. He had shown the glory of God. They had seen beneath the surface for just a moment that God is in their midst. And so they asked each other what life was all about. As they came down the mountain, they encountered one who was troubled for his son. I can't imagine anything I would try to do more than for the love of our children. We'd give anything for their life. And to know that this one is afflicted with demons that it casts him down, sometimes throws him into fires and causes him convulsions. Surely this man begged of Jesus to care for his son. And Jesus took the demons away. But even more than that, he healed the child so that the demons not come back. Because oftentimes we become victims. We fall into the same traps we've always fallen into. And Jesus healed him. And Jesus gave the son back to his father. Holiness happens in the midst of life. It's different for every one of us. There are times in which we come in laughter, times in which we come in tears, times in which we come to weddings, and all we can do is weep. Times in which we come to memorials, and we laugh because this one's life was filled with laughter. For each of us, the circumstance of life is different. But we need to express to one another our faith, not hiding it, not covering it up with a veil, but sharing with one another, I believe in God. We each at different times are wounded. We are broken. That's not a time to hide, but instead a time to stand up and share with others our need for each other, our love for each other, to realize the gifts that otherwise had been deprived. When I heard that Doris was going to have foot surgery, the reality that she might not play it's overwhelming, this gift that she shared with us. To be denied for the last three weeks the ability to talk with you, to share with you, to be there in the midst of struggles. It's painful. But instead, we are able, in the midst of all that is life, to share with each other, to laugh, to cry, to embrace, to withhold from embracing to realize that war does affect us. And so to continue to minister to each other for all their lives. We're about to enter into 40 days of Lent. I've never experienced a Lent, particularly a Holy Week, without it being a cathartic time. I would hope and pray that throughout these 40 days, 
it would be that opportunity for each of us to question, what do I believe? What do I really believe? How is it different from when I was confirmed or when I was baptized? Now, at this stage in my life, in this place, to take the devotionals that Mario's provided for us, to come on Wednesday evenings and share a cup of soup and gather at the table and talk about what's familiar to us that we see in a different light, but also in the midst of our own lives for each of us to pray. For it's in the holiness that we look beneath the surface, beneath the images we take for granted at what God really has going on. Amen.